El Salvador pasó de ser la capital mundial de los homicidios, pasó de literalmente ser el país más peligroso del mundo, a ser el país más seguro de América Latina. Ya no es una promesa, es una realidad que están viviendo los salvadoreños. What happens when a leader rises from the shadows of advertising and turns into the most popular, yet controversial head of state in the world? Is he a hero or a dictator in disguise? Can a single man bring order to a nation once torn apart by gang violence? Or will an iron-fisted approach shatter the fragile democracy he swore to protect? The story of El Salvador's president, Nayib Bukele, is a perfect mix of charisma and controversy. A tale of a man who turned a murder capital into one of Latin America's safest countries. However, his critics argue this has been at the cost of democratic ideals. In this episode of HT in Death, we dive into the rise of Nayib Bukele, who likes to call himself the world's coolest dictator. Before he became the face of modern authoritarianism, Nayib Bukele was an ad man, a master of image, both for brands and later for himself. Bukele's time as the mayor of San Salvador showcased his genius for blending governance with spectacle. He poured funds into public projects like a chic new market and illuminated every corner of the capital, claiming it would reduce crime. But Bukele wasn't just a reformer, he was a performer. He took to social media like a pro, amassing millions of followers who admired his youthful modern image. Aviators, leather jackets, and backward baseball caps became his signature look. However, his relationship with his party, FMLN, soured as he began openly criticizing its leaders. After a public spat in 2017, where he allegedly threw an apple at a fellow official, Bukele was expelled. But the fallout didn't hurt him, it emancipated him. In 2018, he founded his own party, Nuevas Ideas, and set his sights on the presidency. Bukele's political ascent came in 2019, when he ran for president on a promise of radical change. He presented himself as the anti-establishment candidate, promising a fresh start for a country plagued by gang violence and government corruption. He won by a landslide, securing 53% of the vote at just 37 years of age. As president, Bukele's image transformed further. Gone were the musty old drapes and dark wood of the presidential palace. They were quickly replaced with sleek cream walls and a modern minimalist design. His first move? Attacking corruption that plagued the system, or so he claimed. He branded his government as a new era for El Salvador. Como pueden ver ustedes todos, los que estamos aquí reunidos son parte del ejecutivo, del órgano ejecutivo, que es el que el del cual yo estoy encargado, a excepción de una persona. Es el fiscal general que está aquí, él no es del ejecutivo. Y está acá por una razón bien sencilla. Y es porque le quiero pedir en público de que investiguemos a todos los que están acá. Para atrás y para adelante. Yo me imagino que pues no, no hay ningún problema, ¿no? El Salvador was once synonymous with gang violence. For decades, gangs like MS-13 and Barrio 18 terrorized the country, extorting businesses and controlling vast territories. Previous governments had tried, and failed, to combat these powerful criminal organizations. Bukele, however, had promised to end the menace. Once in power, Bukele wasted no time in implementing his tough-on-crime policies. 
His Mano Dura or Iron Fist approach was designed to dismantle the country's notorious gangs, and he wasn't afraid to take drastic measures. In 2022, Bukele declared a state of emergency, suspending key civil liberties and allowing arrests without warrants. Under this regime, more than 81,000 people have been jailed, including minors. The crackdown has been so aggressive that one in every 57 Salvadoran is now behind bars. A statistic that's tripled the incarceration rate of the United States. The mass arrests, including children as young as 12, were often made without warrants. Porque mi hijo es inocente. Mi hijo no es delincuente. Yo lo defiendo. No creo que sea. Porque mi hijo no debe nada. Y vos también te lo llevaron a tener de su trabajo. Si en el posta con mentiras se lo llevaron. Como mentira. Ya tenemos la captura de 85 mil personas adultas. Más de 3 mil niños entre 12 y 17 años. Decirle que de este eh, número que le estoy brindando, estimamos que por lo menos el 30% de estas personas procesadas son inocentes. Bukele's administration promoted its unprecedented crackdown on gangs, showing videos of prisoners stripped to their underwear, frog marched through corridors, and held in the largest prisons ever built in the region. As controversial as they were, Bukele's methods worked, at least in the short term. The murder rate in El Salvador dropped by nearly 70%. Former gang strongholds became peaceful neighborhoods. Families could walk freely in areas once dominated by violence. And the government promoted El Salvador as a land of surf, volcanoes, and coffee. Sí, sí, todo ha sido un cambio totalmente, como dicen, un nuevo amanecer. Definitivamente todo está muy, un gran cambio. Sale uno con confianza y todo. Mire, yo ahorita pues he dejado la puerta abierta y no. Yo sé que así la voy a, a cambiar. Sí, gracias a Dios, todo sano. The international community, however, watched with concern. While Bukele was celebrated at home, he was criticized abroad for his disregard for the rule of law. Human rights organizations accused his government of arbitrary detentions, forced disappearances, and torture. Bukele's most controversial project is the Centro de Contenimiento del Terrorismo, SECOT, a massive prison designed to hold 40,000 inmates. This high-security facility is a visual embodiment of Bukele's authoritarian grip over the country. Government propaganda videos show inmates stripped down to their underwear, marched in lines, and crammed into cells. The world sees these images as a warning, a signal that Bukele is not playing by conventional rules. For Bukele, however, this was another PR triumph. His prison videos became viral sensations on social media, particularly on TikTok, where he has become the most followed world leader. But this hardline approach did not come without consequences. Nearly 140 inmates reportedly die in the prison annually, a mortality rate that Bukele dismisses as lower than in most Latin American countries. His administration questions why international bodies criticize El Salvador's prisons while ignoring the brutality in neighboring countries. Las condiciones en los lugares de detención también son muy preocupantes. Hemos recibido denuncias de graves violaciones de los derechos de los reclusos, como el hacinamiento, el aislamiento prolongado y el hecho de que reclusos con enfermedades crónicas no reciban la medicación prescrita. Resulta especialmente preocupante que 90 personas hayan muerto presuntamente bajo custodia desde que se decretó el estado de excepción. Recordamos a las autoridades que el derecho a la vida, la prohibición absoluta de la tortura, los principios de un juicio justo, incluida la presunción de inocencia. However, Bukele's rise has not been without cost. While Bukele's iron fist policy earned him widespread acclaim, his disregard for democratic norms drew international criticism. Since 2022, 
he has ruled under emergency powers that suspended key civil liberties. This allowed his government to make arrests without warrants and bypass due processes. Critics say this led to mass trials where hundreds of suspects were prosecuted simultaneously, overwhelming the justice system. Bukele also dismantled the judicial system. His allies in the legislature fired top judges and packed courts with loyalists, allowing Bukele to bypass a constitutional prohibition on consecutive presidential terms. In 2024, he won re-election with a staggering 84% of the vote. Moreover, organized political opposition has all but disappeared. Bukele has pulverized his critics, as he puts it. Journalists, defense attorneys, and human rights organizations accuse his government of surveillance, intimidation, and attacks on freedom of expression. Many have also fled the country in fear. Bukele's state of exception has now been renewed more than 29 times, effectively making it a permanent feature of Salvadoran governance. Under this policy, human rights violations have been widespread. Thousands of innocent people have been caught in mass sweeps, with many denied any legal recourse. Bukele's regime has targeted political opponents, defense attorneys, and even journalists who have dared to question his methods. Bukele's authoritarian tendencies were becoming clearer, and critics began labeling him a millennial Cotolo, a tech-savvy strongman for the TikTok age. His government's control over the judiciary meant that there was no legal recourse for those caught in his sweeping security measures. But Bukele remained unfazed by the criticism. In fact, he embraced it. On social media, he changed his bio to world's coolest dictator, mocking the foreign press and his critics. He argued that the safety of the Salvadoran people was more important than preserving fragile democratic systems. In fact, he repeatedly tells the media, go ask the people. Confident that his approval ratings, often soaring above 90%, would speak louder than international reports of abuse. In 2024, Bukele was re-elected in a landslide victory, securing over 84% of the vote. With the courts, legislature and media under his control, El Salvador effectively became a one-party state. His second term is shaping up to be a test of how far Bukele can go in reshaping the country and exporting his brand of authoritarianism. His model of punitive populism is already influencing neighboring countries. Honduras and Ecuador are building prisons inspired by Sukkot, and political leaders across Latin America are referencing Bukele's success in combating crime. Yet, for all his popularity, cracks are beginning to show. Bukele's security policies have come at a significant financial cost. The long-term sustainability of his methods is in question, especially as the economy continues to struggle, with more than a quarter of the population still living in poverty. Nayib Bukele remains a political enigma, a leader who has brought peace and security to a nation long plagued by violence, yet whose methods threaten the very fabric of democracy. His rise from an adman to an authoritarian has captured the world's attention, but the long-term consequences of his iron-fisted rule are yet to unfold. Bukele has signaled that his focus will now shift from security to the economy. But questions remain. El Salvador is one of the poorest countries in the Western Hemisphere. Its public debt has skyrocketed to over $30 billion, that is about 84% of the country's GDP. While his iron fist approach has made El Salvador safer, it has also come with significant human and economic costs. Can Bukele maintain this delicate balance? Will his popularity hold as the country faces deeper economic challenges? How long can a government built on fear and suppression last before people demand more than just safety? Only time will tell.